Here we go. No matter how many times I do this, I never feel ready. Why do I still get nervous when I do this? Did I prep enough? Do I know this well enough? Will that guy who sits in the middle fall asleep again? I know scripture is powerful. I know God is the one who changes lives, but I feel the pressure. Today is someone's first day in church and probably someone else's last shot at God. Okay, Jeff, time to get up for this. Remember, smile and bring the energy. Let's do this. What's the conversation like in your head? You get a picture, a bit of a picture of what the conversation is like in mine. And probably on your worst days and maybe on regular days, your mind is full of a conversation around self-doubt, around lies, around anxiety, an inner critic who continues to tell you how you don't measure up, how you're not enough, how you made a mistake again. There's a book that came out a couple of years ago. It sold millions of copies, and it's by a gentleman named Mark Manson. And the book is called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Blank. I won't say the word. And for Mark Manson, this book resonated with so many people, and I'll tell you why. Because he tapped into something he talked about called the feedback loop from hell. Now, what does he mean by the feedback loop from hell? See if you resonate with this. You get angry at your wife, your son, your girlfriend over something small. And it starts to bother you. And then next thing you know, you're angry about the fact that you got angry about something that didn't mean anything. And now you're angry at yourself for that. And then you realize, man, this happens all the time. And now you're angry about the fact that you're an angry person who got angry at this person you love about something small. And then you're just continually living in this loop of, I'm an angry person. Or maybe for you, you feel anxious about a presentation you have to give at work. And next thing you know, you're saying to yourself, man, why am I always anxious about presentations? And then you say to yourself, man, I hate that I'm always living with this anxiety. Why am I an anxious person? And we do the same thing with guilt. We do the same things in all kinds of other areas of our life. It's the feedback loop from hell. Mark Manson says it this way in his book. He says, we feel bad about feeling bad. We feel guilty for feeling guilty. We get angry about getting angry. We get anxious about feeling anxious. What is wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Ever feel that way? When it comes to your headspace, when it comes to your inner critic, when it comes to the lies you believe, what is wrong with me? Now, why is this an important conversation to have? And I want to tell you why. Because your internal conversations become your external life. Your internal conversations become your external life. I I remember when I was in grade seven or eight, I would get so anxious around tests. The test could be five days away and I'm already having anxiety about it. And that anxiety is building and building four days away, three days away. Next thing you know, I'm starting to study. The night before, I'm studying eight hours, 10 hours, or I'm staying up late. And by the time I go to bed, I'm in tears or I'm sick to my stomach. I go to school the next day and I'm shaking when I arrive at the test. My hands are all sweaty. I write the test and then the countdown is on until the teacher marks the test. One day, two day, three day. The anxiety continues. The fourth day I get the test back. Lo and behold, once again, I get a 95 on the test. A moment of relief. Only on the way out of the class to remember that I've got a test in another subject just two days away. The conversation in my mind about how I want to do well, how I need to do well, how I, I'm not going to perform on this test, how I, I need to study harder. I'm just not good enough. I need to learn more. I'm not as smart as anybody else. That conversation that went on day after day after day after day began to become my life. And I think that happens to all of us throughout our lives. I know it happens to you 
at least in moments of your life. For many of us, your entire life. And that's why this series is critical for you and for those that you love. Now we're going to do four weeks. Today is we're going to be wading into the deep waters. This is a foundational day. We're going to be looking at some theology today, grabbing onto some big chunks. So get ready for that. And by the end, some of you who listen to me regularly are going to say, Jeff, where is the practical side? Where are the handles? Where are the applications for this week? Those will be the next three weeks. In particular, there's an exercise I'm going to take you through on one of the weeks that's really helped me with my inner critic. I'm really excited about that. It's going to be hyper practical the next three weeks. But today is going to be a foundational block. Now, you might be wondering, Jeff, why are you even talking about this? Like, why would you even begin this conversation in our church? I realize it's something that I need personally, but Jeff, what makes you an expert in this area? Now, I'm not claiming necessarily to be an expert, but I know that there are people who deal with the emotional side of this, counselors, psychologists. I see a counselor on a semi-regular basis to help me work out issues in my life, to help me on my own journey in this area. And, And they can help you with the emotional side. We will talk a little bit about it, but they're they're really experts in that. There there are doctors, physicians, medical professionals who are experts on the medical side of this, the way the the brain is wired and how it's created and medication that can help in some cases. And the doctors are experts on the physical side and they can really help you. So we will talk a little bit about the physical side. We will talk a little bit about the emotional side. But I think that when it comes to the conversation going on your mind and my mind, is that there's a spiritual side to it. I truly believe there's a spiritual side to it. And so I think it's important that we look at what God has to say about the headspace of our lives, our inner critic and the lies that we believe. What does scripture have to say? Now, today we're going to look at two questions. The first is, where does this feedback loop come from? And the second is, What can I do about it? So the first is, where does this feedback loop come from? Now, we're going to be looking throughout this series at what Jesus had to say about this area of our lives. But we're going to be also looking at a lot about what the Apostle Paul had to say. Now, if you don't know who the Apostle Paul is, his name was Saul. It became Paul. When he was Saul, he made it his life's mission to persecute and kill Christians. Then he has an encounter with God on the road to Damascus. His life is changed forever. And he becomes really the very first church planter. Churches exist today because of Paul. Now, not every theologian would agree with me because Paul is often seen as a bold person. He was a bold person. But I also see in his writing someone who struggled with anxiety, someone who struggled with worry, someone who struggled with guilt. I mean, imagine he'd been killing Christians. Someone who struggled with, am I good enough? And we're going to learn a lot from the person of Paul. Today, we're going to be looking at Romans, excerpts from Romans 6, 7, and 8. You should read the whole thing if you want to really jump in on this. But I'm going to be pulling different portions of this to help us piece it all together. Now, Paul in Romans chapter 7 shares something with us around the feedback loop. Now, see if this sounds familiar to you. This is what he says. I don't really understand myself. You ever feel that way? Why do I feel guilty? Why do I feel anxious? Why do I lose it all the time? I don't really understand myself. As Mark Manson said, what's wrong with me? He said, for I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I I don't want to be anxious. I don't want to lose my cool. I I don't want to feel guilty. I don't want to feel like I'm not enough. I don't want to feel like I'm not a good enough dad. I don't want to feel like I'm not beautiful. I know I shouldn't keep hearing these things in my life. I I don't want to feel them, but I continue to do it. I continue to struggle with it. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, he says, this shows that I agree that the law is good. He's saying, okay, the the fact that I know that I want what's right, the fact that I know that I want what's good, I mean, that's a a good sign. He talks about the law. Now, the law is in the Old Testament. Paul's writing in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, it was the law that religious leaders had to to live a life where you would thrive. He says, I know I want to thrive. I know I want to do what's good. So, So that's good. But then the wrong thing keeps happening. So I'm not the one doing wrong, he says. It is sin living in me that does it. Now, this is the first mention of sin living in me. 
He's pointing to sin. Maybe you're listening to this and you thought to yourself, man, a church thing, this is just what I expected. They're talking about sin. But I think today, when you look, you and I look and we see what scripture has to say, what Paul has to say about sin, it's going to be a game changer for you. Now, now follow along. He says, and I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. He's saying there's a, a sinful nature in me. There, there's a sinful part of me. He says, I, I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. Sound familiar? He says, but if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. I don't want to believe these lies in my head. I don't want to hear this self-criticism. And it connects us. We would say, whether you agree with us or not, that in addition to our inner critic, there's an enemy, Satan himself, who, who wants to throw lies at us. And we're going to talk about that in this series. I don't want to give in to the lies. I don't want to be an anxious person. I don't want to be an angry person. I don't want to be in this feedback loop that I'm not enough. Jeff, what does this feedback loop have to do with sin? Because Paul is connecting these things. I think when it comes to sin, one of the issues we have is how we define it. When we think of sin, we think of the behavior of sin. The behavior of sin is about what we do. Murder, cheating, stealing. That's the behavior of sin. That's how it works itself out in our lives. Not a good thing. But what Paul is talking about here is the root of that. What Paul is talking about is the condition of sin. The condition of sin. The condition of sin is about our brokenness. Now, Paul, when he refers to the word sin in Romans, 46 times he refers to it as a noun. In most times, the condition of sin. Twice he refers to it as a verb, what we do. Paul is focused on this sinful nature, this condition of sin. And it's really about our brokenness. It's the broken part of us. You know, maybe for you, it's the decisions that you've made. It's the decisions all of us have made as individuals that have broken us on the inside. Maybe you made a decision. You got trapped up as an alcoholic. Maybe you struggle with anger and and you've let that have a way in your life. Maybe you've chosen pornography. Maybe you have a relationship that ended in heartache. This is, these are choices that we've made that have broken us on the inside and put us in the condition of sin. In fact, scripture would say way back in Genesis 3, in Adam and Eve is where the sinful nature began. It's where this brokenness began in our lives, that we're born with it. But brokenness and the condition of sin can also be sin that's happened to you. You've been abused. A teacher said something to you. A coach said something to you that hurt you, that cut you, that was a lie that you believed. You lost a loved one. You went through an illness. This, this is brokenness that happens because of the sin in our world. It's our sinful condition. And our brokenness is what our inner critic leverages against us. Where the lies hit us the hardest, where the doubt hits us the hardest, where the guilt hits us the hardest is in our brokenness. Okay, Jeff, what does this look like? Because you're getting pretty philosophical on me. What does this look like? Stay with me, okay? The condition of sin, part of it, is the desire to complete ourselves. This is, this is where you see it. We try to complete ourselves by being someone who we aren't or by getting something that we don't have that someone else has. We feel like if we can fill this hole in ourselves by being someone different or by having something different, that's going to make us feel complete. That really is a big part of the condition of sin. There's a monk. His name is Thomas Merton. American monk, a famous, written tons of books. He wrote tons of books, a contemplative and also a bit of a controversial character around social justice. Definitely worth checking out. And Thomas Merton talked about the false self as being a big part of the condition of sin. The false self that we want to be like them, that we want to have what they have. We think these things are going to fill us. And the more we lean into who we aren't, and the more we lean into what we don't have, the more we become people that God doesn't recognize, that God didn't create. 
let me give you a small example of this. A number of years ago, I became the lead pastor here at Connexus, and I took the torch from Kerry Newhoff, an incredible leader, attends our church, a friend, loved being under his leadership. I took the torch from him, and when I became the lead pastor, being on video became a really big part of my life. And I remember standing in front of a camera trying to make a three-minute announcement, and it took almost three hours. And I couldn't get it right, and I couldn't say it the right way, and I was trying to say it how Carrie would say it, you know? And then I had Carrie come in, and Carrie coached me, say it like this or say it like that. You should say it that way. And he was trying to help me. And three hours later, I was done. And I, honestly, after three hours, I didn't even know what I said. I didn't feel good about things. I felt like I was almost trying to be someone else. And Justin Piercy, who's on our team, stopped me on the way out the door. And he said to me, Jeff, if you're going to lead this church, you can't try to say things how Carrie says them. You got to say them how you say them. You can't try to lead how Carrie leads. You got to lead from who you are. But for me, I was trying to be someone who I wasn't. And the more I did that, the more it was killing me on the inside. And we do this all the time. And social media has made it so much harder. When we see everybody's Instagram highlight reel in front of our face every single day, and we think, man, if I was more like them, I'd be more complete. You see that mom who, you know, she grows the organic food in her yard. She serves it in wooden bowls. She carved herself. She's feeding it to her kids on Instagram. And it looks like a Pinterest page. And you're looking at your Tupperware container full of orange goldfish and you don't even know what chemical they put in it to make it orange. They say it's cheese. We fed it to our kids. And you're thinking, I'm a terrible mom. I need to be more like that mom. I'll feel more complete if I'm like them. I'll feel more complete if I do what they do. It's the false self. Trying to be someone who you weren't created to be and thinking that that being someone else is at the end of the day going to complete you, let alone the fact that it's their highlight reel. And the truth is, is that God, as a mom, didn't call you to be a mom to those kids. He called you to be a mom to your kids. He didn't make you to be that person. He made you to be the person that you are. He loves you for who you, he made you to be. It's one thing to try to improve. It's another thing to try to be someone else, to have what someone else has. I, I just need to be a dad like that dad. I need to be a boss like that boss. I need to be an employee like that employee. And to start to live in the false self and to try to be somebody who you're not and to strive and to strive is a condition of sin because you're looking at that to complete you or to have something that you weren't meant to have. Or you aren't able to have and striving to have it. People in the pandemic striving for certainty, certainty that they could never have was killing them on the inside. And they would do anything to find certainty in their life. But at the end of the day, they couldn't find it. And it would end up killing them on the inside, making decisions they shouldn't make. Financially, wanting to have a certain amount of finances, a certain car, a certain house, a certain lifestyle that you see someone else have. And you think, if I had all of that, I would feel complete. That's our sinful condition. Trying to be something we aren't. Trying to do something we aren't meant to do. To be someone we aren't meant to be. Someone who probably doesn't really truly exist in the first place. And after a while, I wonder if God even recognizes us. Thomas Merton says this, every one of us is shadowed by an illusory person, a false self. There's a shadow we're always trying to be. He says, a life devoted to the cult of this shadow is what is called a life of sin, of brokenness. Our brokenness is what our inner critic leverages to lie to us. When we're broken and we say we're not enough, when we're broken on the inside and we say, I, I, I'm just not enough. I'm just, I, I just will need to be like them. I just need to be like that person. I, I, I just need to have what they have. And we become more broken as we try to complete ourselves in that way again and again and again. And the inner critic gets in there and lies to us. You're right. You're not like them. You're right. You don't measure up. You're right. You should have what they have. You're right. You don't have what it takes. You're right. You're not beautiful enough. You're right. You should feel guilty that you're not like them. And the feedback loop continues as a result of our condition of sin. 
So what do we do about it? Where do we begin? How do we start? What does Paul say about this condition of sin? Because there's hope coming. This is what he says in Romans chapter six. He says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. He says, Jesus lived a perfect life and died on the cross for our sin to break the power of sin in our lives. He says, we're no longer slaves to sin. That Jesus died to free us from sin. That, that there's a power. He broke the power of sin. He says, for when, when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. He said, when we, he died, he died once to break the power of sin. He keeps talking about this, break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Now, now he, here's the interesting thing, because Because Jesus died to break the power of sin, Paul is saying. He broke the power of sin when he died on the cross. But there's still the presence of sin in the world. That's what we struggle with. That when we choose to follow Jesus and we say, I'm going to surrender my life to you and accept the fact that you died on the cross to break the power of sin in my life. He gives us access to that power. But at the same time, we struggle with the presence of sin every day. So, So what do we do with that? Paul tells us in Romans chapter six, he says this. So you should, you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin. Now this word consider yourselves really could be translated. Some, some translations say reckon could be translated recognize. What he's saying is you need to recognize that you're dead to the power of sin. You need to recognize in your mind. You need to remember in your mind that you're not a slave to the power of sin, but because Jesus died on the cross, you're alive in Christ. He says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument to the evil to, of evil to serve sin, including your mind. He says, instead, give yourself completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. Use your body. So use your body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. And then he says this, sin is no longer your master. Live under the requirements of the law for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. You're no longer a slave to sin, but you live under the freedom of sin. What's Paul getting at? He's saying where we focus our attention determines what grows. Where we focus our attention determines what grows. What happens, you see, is when we get in that feedback loop, our mind is so focused on my anxiety, my grief, my guilt, my, my frustration, my anger, the fact that I don't have, that I'm not beautiful enough, that I don't measure up. When we focus on the lies in our lives and we focus on the messages in our lives that tell us we're not enough, that we need to be someone else, that we need to have something else, where we focus our attention determines what grows. And what Paul is saying is don't focus on those things. Focus on the fact that Jesus died on the cross, loved you so much that he died on the cross to break the power of sin in your life, that you are no longer need to be a slave to sin. You no longer need to be a slave to those things, but he died to break the power of sin in your life. See your internal conversation becomes your external life. So Paul is saying, change the conversation. Remember when you experience the presence of sin, the condition of your sin, to remember that because of Jesus, he broke the power of sin. Now, Paul says, hey, you're no longer a slave to sin. Slave is a a strong word these days. It was then as well. See, the truth is we're all a slave to something. That's what scripture would say. We're we're all a slave to something. And many of us have chosen, chosen to be slaves to sin, chosen to be slaves to the false self, chosen to be a slave to the lies in our life, chosen to be a slave to our condition of sin and live in the feedback loop. But what if you chose to be a slave to something else? What if you chose to say, no, I'm going to serve the God who loves me, who cares about me. 
who died to break the power of sin in my life. I'm going to continue to focus on that. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. The wages of the sinful condition. The way that giving in to the sinful condition in your life goes is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life. I, I want to give you a little bit of a picture of this. When, when I was in high school, I desperately wanted people to like me. I, I would do almost anything to get people to like me. And I realized that one of the ways I could really get people to like me was to make them laugh. And that if I could be funny and I could hear them laugh, I would start to feel good about myself. It would fill some kind of hole in me, probably gave me some kind of dopamine hit. And I'm not really, if, if you know me today, I'm not really the funniest guy. I'm no comedian. But back then, at, when I graduated high school, one of the awards I won was I got voted class clown. And that carried over into my life. I did that through university. I always had to be the funniest guy in the room. And then I went into ministry and I preached a sermon one Sunday. And people were just laughing. And sometimes I was trying hard and they weren't laughing, but I kept trying to make them laugh. I had a mentor of mine come up to me after that message. And he said to me, Jeff, how do you think it went? And I said, man, I said, people were really engaged. They're laughing the whole time. They were really with me. And he said to me in the most sincere way possible, the most empathetic way possible, Jeff, one day you're going to be more concerned about whether people's lives are being transformed by Jesus when they walk out that door than whether you made them laugh. What was he pointing out to me? That I thought, man, if I could just get people to like me, it's going to fill that hole. How sad is that? That, that if I could just make them laugh, I could feel good just for a moment. I mean, if you've dealt with addiction, you know this. If I could just have one more drink, if I could just have one more pill, for a moment, it would make me feel complete. If I could just be like that mom for a moment, if we could just have the money they have for a moment, man, if I could just get there, there's something about that that would make me feel whole. But the truth is at the end of the day, it ends up feeling empty. You're beco I'm becoming someone I'm not. You're becoming someone you aren't. You, you spend your whole life trying to live someone else's life. The wages of our sinful condition is death. But the gift of God and freedom because of the power of Jesus, death on the cross that broke the power of sin, that is the gift of life. See, the, the condition of sin is more an infection to be healed than the things that you do. It's like you've got an infection and Jesus broke the, the power of that infection and wants to bring healing to your life throughout your life. And it's more than just the things that you do or don't do. Paul in Romans 8 says this. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. Letting the lies, letting the feedback loop, letting that thing that someone once told you about you that's not true, your self-doubt, your guilt, your anxiety, letting it control the conversation in your mind leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. In a lot of ways, that's what this whole series is going to be about. That Jesus left the power of his Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit with us, who wants to remind us in our minds, the Spirit is saying to us, Jesus broke the power of sin in your life. Focus on me. Focus on what he has for you. What you pay attention to will grow. Romans 12 says, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then, when he transforms how you think, then you will learn to know God's will for you. Not that person's will, not the false self, not trying to be them, not trying to be that person, not trying to have what they have. When you renew your mind, then you will know God's will for you, his good and pleasing and perfect will. As you change your mind, it changes your life and it changes what you want. Steve Cuss wrote a book called Managing Leadership Anxiety, 
which I would recommend. And he says, the miracle of salvation isn't that Jesus stops us from sinning or being tempted to sin. It's that Jesus changes what our heart wants. Jesus changes what our heart wants. We don't want to be someone else. We don't want to have what someone else has. We don't want to try to live something that we aren't. But we change our hearts. Jesus changes our hearts to want the things that he wants for us. To want the things that you want, that he wants for you. See, Jesus, Jesus broke the power of sin. I want you to look at this on the, on the screen. Jesus broke the power of sin so you don't have to blank. I want you to fill that in. See, Jesus broke the power of sin so I don't have to make people laugh so they like me anymore. And there are days I struggle with it. But Jesus broke the power of sin so I don't have to. Jesus broke the power of sin so you don't have to strive to have this, to, to be like the other girls in your class. Jesus broke the power of sin so, so you don't have to feel guilty about not being that mom all the time. Jesus broke the power of sin so you don't have to feel guilty about being that dad all the time. Jesus died to free me from needing to blank anymore. He broke the power of sin so, so you don't have to feel the pressure to be someone you aren't anymore. Jesus broke the power of sin so that you don't have to believe the lies anymore. The lie that you're not good enough. The lies that you won't be enough. The, the lie that, that you'll never ever get there. Jesus broke the power of sin so you don't have to believe those lies anymore. Galatians 5, Paul writes this. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and don't let yourself be burdened by a yoke of slavery. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Not to carry this yoke of slavery to our sinful condition, but he broke the power of sin so that you could be free. I'm going to ask that we put that on the screen again, that phrase. I want you to fill in the blank. Jesus died, broke the power of sin so you don't have to blank anymore. What would you put in that blank? Jesus broke the power of sin so you don't have to what anymore? If you're not quite sure what exactly to put in there, I want you to think about it. I want you to spend time paying attention to your internal conversations because the inner critic, the doubts, the lies, the guilt, those are not from God. What is from God is he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to break the power of sin. So you don't have to be trapped in that feedback loop and you don't have to believe those lies anymore. Let's pray together. God, I come to you today and I lift up those who are saying, man, when I pay attention to my inner dialogue, whether it's on my bad days or every day, I feel the weight of that. I pray that they would know that you want freedom for them in the midst of this, that you died on the cross, Jesus, to break the power of sin. And that we would focus our minds on, th on those things, on that. Whenever we struggle, that we would focus on, them, on the fact in our minds that you died to break the power of sin, that you died to set us free, that you wanted us to have freedom. And that over the course of the next three weeks, that at the end, we would walk away understanding more of what it means to have freedom in our minds so that we can have freedom in our lives. And we pray this in your name. Amen.